started for today. Uh, this is the EM class, Engineering Management, and today we're going to look at lecture number 12 of the MIT series, uh, Management and Information Technology. Last time we did intellectual property and uh, what else did we do? Uh, I don't know, copyright, rights, rights, uh, stealing, business problems, and stuff of that nature. So moving right along with that trend, uh, we're looking at the emerging, emerging trends and technologies for business people and technology. I'm going to kind of skip ahead a little bit here and get into the introduction in terms of what it is we're talking about. <coughs> this lecture is all about emerging trends and technology and it is more of the current activities that are going on in the field of engineering management versus some of the traditional stuff uh, in terms of the organization of the technology or the management parts of it that we've been, I've been kind of giving you um, all all term. Um, and so this week, um, this week is kind of putting some of it together in terms of what, what do we do looking forward. Talking about Web 2.0, Web 3.0, virtual reality, biometrics used, biochips, spatial recognition, RFIDs, uh, Bluetooth, Wi Fi. Well, Wi Fi is pretty old. Push and pull technologies. So this is the big picture. Can we have, um, I know I have a microphone and hopefully it's projecting, but can we tr can we just uh, cut down a little bit on the chatter? There we go. It just makes it easier. I don't feel like I have to talk over people. Um, but anyway, uh, that's the focus. This is the focus of today's lecture, which is sitting on the slide here. Um, some of the students have said something about engineering management too. Just so that you know, Engineering Management 1, this is the first semester that we've been requiring this course as a core course for the Engineering Management program. If you're brand new to ITU and you've taken this course your first term here, it's a required core for you. If you're an existing ITU student prior to the start of this term, you don't have to take the second course, the EM902, as part of your course requirements. You don't have to take that. It's optional for you. It's only for the brand new students who started this term, this course, and then the next one, 902, are required. 902 will be offered in the summer. So and I'll probably be teaching it in the summer term. Um, and it will also be offered next fall. So you guys will have plenty of time to get the second part of this course. It will be offered not next term in spring, but it's going to be offered in the following term. Um, and then if you are taking this course, it's either an elective for engineering or it's an elective for business. So it falls in either side you want as a business course, because that's the other question I've been getting asked today is, um, is it going to be counted as part of my five EMs or is it part of my six business? It's either one. Just like your CPT, you can count in either direction depending upon where you need to use it. And it applies towards both EM1 and EM2, the 900 and 901, or whatever the numbering series happens to be. Okay, I just thought I'd mention that because I, I didn't mention it before. All right, so in the changing market and the changing internet, we have the software as a service concept. We have push, not pull technologies, personalization. Um, voice over IP, Web 2.0, Web 3.0, other types of technologies to look at. And we talked about and have looked at software as a service. This will definitely be one of the questions on the final. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm going to give you 25 or 30 questions. And it's an essay kind of final where you take a look at the questions. And I'll tell you the question subject areas in the coming weeks, probably the week before the final. You go home, you figure out, well, which, which ones of these questions do I like? You pick five of them on the day of the exam and you write five short answers essays. There's like a couple paragraphs or so for each question. One of them might be software as a service as an example. And the question might be phrased something in the nature of, you know, delivering not not what is software as a service, but how can it be used to help an organization um, cut costs or become more effective or produce better products or something. So delivery of the model is in which you are paying for software as a paid per use service. Instead of buying software, you're buying the use or the licensing of the software. It's a service versus a software. A good example of software as a service is um, Microsoft 360. Uh, eventually, it'll be all online. You buy a year, $99 a year or so. You keep buying it every year. So that's a service, which is kind of like um, if you're uh, going to go that route uh, as a company you get paid for the licenses that are out there. So you make more money as a company providing the service. Uh, as a consumer, you don't have to spend as much. 
and you're constantly up to date. Because when you buy software, traditionally, it's out of date a couple, you know, a couple months after you buy it. There's a new version of it out there. Are you going to get a free upgrade? Are you going to be on the old version? And a lot of people use old software, actually, because they don't want to upgrade. And in this particular case, uh, that kind of avoids that problem as a consumer. So there's pros and cons for the business, pros and cons for the consumers on this. And there, we also have application service providers, ASPs, um, as, as well as and most people are familiar with ISPs, Internet Service Providers. We also have application server provider, service providers, which is the same thing for Internet access, but it's applications. So it's application software provided. So software as a service in terms of the, you know, the personal... Um, application server provider that's providing you and then we have payment receipts that go back and forth between companies it's kind of like your cable actually your cable bills now are software as a service some of the content on your digital cable is provided over IP internet protocol some of it is actually from a cable provider many different sources to, all aggregated together in some sort of a plan that you're getting with premium channels and basic service and yada yada sometimes these premium plans also include internet access or they may also include telephone service styles you know regular old voice service or something um, so that's really the service concept that's the direction the world's going in if you haven't figured it out yet so as an engineering manager and you're in the company and you're deciding on these resources and utilities and features to offer uh, your customers but also to uh, use as the company. Um, a lot of this information um, is relevant in terms of your decision making and you don't want to rely 100% on what the vendors are telling you because the vendors want to make money and that companies want to save money. You're in the, definitely you're on the opposite side of the bargaining negotiation. So push not pull technologies and personalization is also the bigger, bigger trend. Mm. Pull was, um, we live in a pool environment, actually. Pull is like drag you into a website. Drag you into a website. Uh, so that is websites that request information, products, and services. The future is push environment. Put it out there. Push it to you. Get your familiar with it. You're going to buy it. Hopefully. We're not going to drag you into the website, but we're going to push it at you. Push it at you what? Through media. So if you haven't noticed, there's a lot of convergence here. So your smart, well, mobile marketing is, is incredibly good because you buy an app and we're going to push an ad to you. That's push technology. Sometimes it's push and pull together because you put your finger on it, click on the little ad, it brings you to the website. Oh, look at that. That's pull. So push is to throw it at you, pull is to drag you into it. Um, they both sound kind of negative, but uh, they're marketing activities. Um, the original push technology was spam mail. Spam email doesn't work anymore. We're not gonna, but instead, we're going to throw a commercial at you or something. You don't have to go to the commercial. We're just going to throw it at you. Or subliminally give you a message that says, hey, you need to buy this product. Why do I need to buy this product? Because I saw it in a movie. It actually happens in movies all the time. You see some movies and all the notebooks in the movie say Sony on them. Or they say Apple on them. That's push technology, actually. You're watching a movie. It's like, oh, that's a really cool notebook. Oh, look at that computer. It's a big old Apple on it. Wow. Everybody uses Apple. You know, so then you go buy an Apple computer. Uh, so push technology environment which businesses come to you with information. Services offering you products and services based on your profile. Your information. It's not spam or mass email. Businesses will know so much about you that they can tailor and customize your offerings. Google is a huge push technology company. They're collecting information. They're giving you push advertisement. Everything is pushed for them. Um, and you're getting it for free. Lo and behold. And who's doing it? Well, everybody out there is paying Google to push their technology. <laughs> so their ads. So that's how they make money, actually, is they're, they're getting companies to, to use their push service to send you stuff. And then now everything's connected. So, you know, your G Plus is connected with your 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 YouTube account, connected to your Gmail account, connected to your Circles account, connected to everything. If everything's all connected, so is your information. If you're rich, then it gives them a stronger push pool, a push, a push technology offering. So considering also GPS and location services, that's uh, within the last year, I'm glad they're giving you an option now. Originally, I thought there wasn't going to be any options at all. You can turn off your location services. You can tell certain apps on your iPhone, don't look at my GPS information. 
And uh, a lot of people are having problems with uh, paranoia and those little cameras on their computers because there's apps and there's things that look at the camera and record and send the information that they're getting from the camera device just the same way as you're getting at the service devices for your GPS. When you're using the app, the app knows, the company knows, the server knows where you are. So a lot of paranoid people don't want to know. They don't want to be tracked like that. Or they didn't know they take little stickers and they put them on over the camera, <laughs> cover up the camera lens. I don't want people to look at me while I'm, you know, don't know that they're looking at me. You know, who knows where I am, you know, kind of thing. Uh, which is a paranoia in some cases, but also there's some truth to it. I haven't covered up my cameras yet, but I do turn off my location services. I don't use that. I turn off my location services because it wears down my battery because every app is using it. So I get better battery life if I turn off the location services. So if I could figure out how to disable the camera, which you can't disable, then I'd have been better security there. But anyway, long story short, I'm borderlining on being paranoid if I start doing that. So the so system will determine if there are any movies you like, which you haven't seen. Perhaps the system will call your cell phone, send you a text message, send you... I don't know, a little information about, hey, you're in the area, there's this concert, did you know about the concert? Or did you know about the movie? Or you watch this movie and you watch that movie, oh, we know you're going to want to see this movie, so we're going to put little pictures of the movie up on your, on your Google account or something. You know? Or we're going to connect you, give you friend offerings to, you know, look here, you can review the movie or something. It's really weird psychology, different marketing than ever before. So if you haven't taken a marketing class and you're in the industry, uh, haven't taken a current marketing class, it's kind of different. Like social media marketing, push technologies, te it's all technology driven today. So the old days of putting up a billboard on the freeway or a, a radio or a TV commercial is old school at this point. A lot of people don't even watch TV anymore. It's all, well, they watch TV, but they don't watch it through broadcast. They watch it through digital IP service or cable service. So IP service, I'm referring to like the Roku's or the Chromecast. If you haven't tried out Chromecast, it's the best thing <laughs> since sliced bread, in my opinion. Uh, it's for 35 bucks. You can have a smart TV on a dumb TV. You know, you just have this little USB thing. You plug it into the computer. You go to Google Chrome, you go to Netflix, you go to anything you want, and you broadcast it on your TV. Who needs a DVD player anymore? Nobody. Who needs cable service anymore? Nobody. <laughs> so, and so it depends on what kind of technology you want to use, how familiar you are, and how adverse you are to technology. A lot of older people, they would barely own computers. They're not going to get a Chromecast <laughs> and hook it up and use it. They're not even going to, you know, they're not even going to know what that is, actually. And they're afraid of the Internet. Perhaps they don't even have Internet access in their home. So it's all dependent upon how technology aware and uh, diverse you are. So push-pull technologies and personalization. Personalization is a big part of it. So here's F2B to C, factory <coughs> to business to consumer. So it's really new e-commerce models looking at. In fact, this has been going on for, I want to say, about four or five years so far. You know, in the old days, you uh, would have, uh, you know, say a garage sale. You know, you'd open up your garage. This is kind of a foreign concept to most people. Americans had garage sales in the summertime. You open up the garage, you stick all the crap out on the curb, you put a little sign out there, and people walk by. Hey, 50 cents, a dollar, you sell stuff, right? And people went, oh, that's too much work. I said, oh, let's just put it on eBay. So you went and you listed it. You went to your garage and said, oh, look, I have an old DVD player. I got this. Let me find some pictures. I'll stick it up on eBay. People buy it, I go to the UPS store, or the, you know, you just buy some boxes at Walmart, you ship it out yourself, or you get one of those postage paid boxes from our U.S. Postal Service, whatever. Now they don't even do that. Now I go in my garage and go, my garage is empty. I got nothing in my garage. What am I going to do? I'm going to go online and see who's selling stuff. Yeah. Oh, I like this. I like, oh, that's a good deal. Let me buy a thousand of those. Hop, don't ship them to me. Ship them to my customers. I'm going to go online, I'm going to open up an eBay account, and I'm going to list this product. So we got a lot of people selling stuff they have never even seen before. They don't even know what it is. They have never seen that product before, but they're getting it from sources that are providing them with garages full of items. It's like Overstock, as an example. Overstock based themselves on getting rid of crap. I shouldn't call it crap. Some of the stuff's good, but it's cheap, and it's sight unseen. It's a box of something somewhere in the world that someone's going to ship, and they don't even see it. Why ship it to me when I didn't buy it? I'm not even going to give you any money until I sell it. 
my customers are going to buy it, ship it to my customers. So you're relying upon a third-party company to actually ship it to the customer, and that's kind of risky, but you have to have a good agreement put together. And uh, you're relying upon the quality on a product you've never seen. So take it a step further in the year 2010-ish, 11-ish, 90% of that's now international. Don't even, if you're not going to make it in the U.S., why ship it to the U.S.? So some, most of the stuff comes from overseas somewhere. So we don't even see it in here. It just goes from there to here, from China to here. Go on and take a look at some of the accessories you could buy for computers. None of them, no one has even seen these things. They don't even know where they're from. They get shipped from a warehouse in China or Hong Kong. or they get, they're, they're coming from somewhere. Who knows where. It's diverse. It's not just one company. It's everybody's doing it. So That's a F2B2C. <laughs> That's factory to business to consumer. And it's really going from factory to consumer, getting rid of all the middleman costs and shipping products and stuff like that. So the other thing, too, is you get are people that are in business to sell other people's products and services that um, are actually part of the development. So they say, hey, you know what? I think it would be really cool to have these earphones in pink. Can you make me a batch in pink? Oh, no problem. The company makes the batch. So now the person who's selling it is now sort of acting like a manufacturer. So that's redistribution or reintermediation where you got a disintermediation where you pull out everybody and you just got a manufacturer and you got a salesperson and everybody in the middle is gone and you're just selling product for somebody. And then you got the reintermediation where now the salesperson is the manufacturer, the distributor, the R&D person, the marketing person, everything else, and they're coming up with their own products. So it's really nice actually. It's kind of a change and that's really modern day e-commerce from the last five years or so. Uh, now we're getting it not only with products but we're getting it with services now. So most people have ever done a Groupon or have ever done any type of coupon thing. It started out with the coupons and the Groupons and stuff where you, you buy a coupon or you get a coupon for buying another coupon or you sub sign up to a service to get coupons <laughs> for free. Yada yada. Those people are buying the service to provide the coupon. It's a service that they're not even buying. They have no idea what this product is even about. It's, it's, it's a movie, or it's a show ticket, or it's a something, or it's $15 off at a restaurant or something. They have no idea what restaurant you're going to go to or where, where this thing is going to actually be used or whether you're going to use it at all. All they're <laughs> concerned is is the fee that they're going to collect for aggregating it, getting it together, and making it available as a service. So now you're not even selling a product anymore. <laughs> you're selling <coughs> something. What are you selling? You know, and then now we have these companies that provide with, for example, um, if you've ever done any of the meetup stuff, there's a couple, of, it's called Event Brights or Events or something. It's a company that just puts people who want to have events, and they want to charge for admission, with people that want to pay for the admission or want to, maybe it's free as well. It's a service that they're just putting people together, but it's not auction <laughs> service like eBay. eBay started out with the first kind of thing where you get consumers, you get sellers, we'll just give them a platform and put them all together. So eBra events, events, brights, and I can't remember the other. There's a couple other companies out there that do it. They're just, it's like a block, uh, what was that? Not Blockbuster. Uh, block something? Maybe it is. is it, maybe it's Blockbuster? I don't know. No, Block something. Uh, where you buy concert tickets and stuff through them. You buy tickets and they have tickets for this concert, they have tickets for that concert, just for this wine festival, tickets for this event. Or like travel agents, they sell you packages, you know, get this trip, this trip, this trip, this trip, or flight, flight agents of the past. Well, in the past it was all done by agents or by, now you do it yourself as a consumer. If you're going to do it yourself as a consumer, you can go to these websites like um, cheaphotels.com or something or cheapflights.com. And the hotel, excuse me, the website, the business is running the website, has no idea what you're buying or selling or anything. They're just providing you the service of being able to do that. So anyway, that's kind of the major concept of uh, modern day, the difference between old day and modern day um, e-commerce. Here's that word I was talking about, a form of disintermediation, taking out the middleman, getting rid of it, the use of the internet as a delivery vehicle, always intermediate players in the whereby intermediate players in the distribution channel can be bypassed or eliminated. 
So the guy who's selling it is not the manufacturer, is not the retailer, is not the distributor, doesn't know anything. He's just picking it from the factory. He's not even picking it up. Having somebody pick it up from the factory and sell it. So now, if you haven't noticed, we've got voice over IP pretty pretty dominant now, or getting there. Um, this is uh, your Skype, your Vonage. I think Vonage was the first company that really started out with this. Now it's Google Voice. Google Voice is pretty popular. It's voice traffic over internet traffic. Nothing new. It's gotten better over the years. It still has problems. It's still very insecure. Um, it's data traveling over the internet, just like your other data traveling over the internet. And not going to encrypt it. Not going to do anything to it to protect it, which means, um, if I don't know if you watched that thing that was on Channel 9, uh, local PBS kind of channel. They did a thing. How long, it takes seven and a half minutes for your credit card to be um, compromised over, um, I don't remember what service it was. I think they were using Google Voice or Vonage or something. I can't remember what it was, but they were using a voice over IP service. And they narrowed it down to seven and a half minutes. So if you make a call over voice over IP, you give out your credit card information, just make a call, pay your bill. I wouldn't do this at home because you're going to lose your credit card. But use your card to pay your PG&E bill or your gas bill or something. Just pay a bill with it. And get so you're transmitting all the information. You transmit. What's your card number? Da da da. What's the expiration? Da da da. What's the three-digit number on the back? Da da da. Who are you? Let me confirm your address. Da da da. All this stuff goes over the like, conversation. It takes seven and a half minutes for somebody else to use your credit card information. <laughs> Long story short, over over voice over IP. According to this study, the study is about five, about maybe four or five years old right now. Actually. This was right when um, Skype and Vonage and everybody was coming out with this and they were trying to protect consumers with don't use this for private information. And then people think, oh, you know, it's just a telephone because there's this expectation traditionally in America of privacy over the phone when there is nothing. There's no expectation of privacy on voice over IP. In fact, it's the exact opposite. If you're using Google Voice, the information is being data mined. All the stuff you're saying is being recorded and used and part of the analytics for the selling you new products and services. Oh, you were talking about ski trip. You must be going on a ski trip. We're going to send you, we're going to push you some ads about snow packages and lift tickets and stuff. You're talking to your friends about skiing. Uh, so the information is kind of, and a lot of people think, well, there's uh, no privacy there. You're right, there is no privacy there. But you're getting it for free. There's a cost for the freeness of it. But long story short, um, now I, I would almost say that it's probably two minutes or three minutes. Seven minutes is pretty, seven and a half minutes seems pretty slow to me right now. So I actually accidentally did it myself um, in the beginning. And I actually did it over a Google Voice account. And it took about 15 minutes. And uh, I did it with a card, one of those prepaid cards, Visa card things. And uh, it, the, the balance was empty in about 15 minutes <laughs> on that card. <laughs> so... Don't use your ATM card unless you've really got some protection from your bank or your Visa card unless you've got a little limit on that Visa card because you're going to have all your money taken away from you within about seven and a half minutes right now. It took me 15 minutes. About, I thought it was about 15 minutes for it to happen to me. But I used like a $20 or a $30 card when There's I did no it. There's no way to get your money back. Well, then you have to fight with your bank. It's it's you gave out all the information so anyone who wants to can just buy stuff all over the place with your information. So they're using it like you're doing it. How's the how are the transaction will go through just fine? Originally, a lot of the banks said, "Well, you're in California, and now your transaction happened in Florida or in Colorado." And two seconds later, we had one done in Arizona, and they used to catch it in the beginning because of the locations and then I went well that person could be just on a shopping spree on the internet and then they said okay then they just said okay wait a minute now all right shopping spree on the internet okay that works but what about the duration what happens if they come in simultaneously that's when it's caught you're not doing it simultaneously so you gotta hope that whoever gets it will start charging simultaneously because if they charge one or two things and there's like a five minute distance between them it's okay. 
if they do it at the same exact time, how can you be doing two transactions at the same exact time if you're not two people? <laughs> so then that usually triggers and stops the activity on the card, the simultaneous transactions. I know that's just one, a couple of the banks that I'm familiar with that use that technique. I'm sure that there's other techniques out there. In fact, I'm sure one of these days, if it hasn't happened yet, you'll have the option as a consumer to set the limit. In the past, or set the set the level of restriction, in the past you actually used to have to call your bank to say that you were traveling. Hey, I'm going to Europe. Can you let's note that on my account? Because when you got to Europe and you started using your bank card, it would de get declined. <laughs> because, what are you doing in Europe? You're not supposed to be in Europe. You're in California. And your bank would think that that was fraudulent. And then consumers complained about it. How can we have to keep calling our... People still call their bank. You don't have to call your bank anymore. Your bank lifted all those restrictions for you. <laughs> and now, yes, it's the opposite. you got to call your bank. You know what? Don't let any transactions go through on this card at all. Stop everything. Because I'm not using this card. It's not in my possession. Oh, Okay. Should we cancel it now, or do you want me to cancel it tomorrow? No, oh, cancel it now. There are, the, the philosophy is kind of switched around backwards now because the problem was consumers in the old days didn't have all these options. The Internet wasn't quite as strong. E-commerce wasn't working the same way. Now with all this flexibility and the options, it makes it a burden to use the card. So we remove all of the restrictions, make it as easy as possible, let the consumer do whatever they want. If the consumer wants to protect themselves, now it's your job. So you've got to go sign up for services that help you, you know, protection services for your cards, protection services for the transactions you're doing. You can actually put limits. You can actually set a limit for most banks right now to say, I don't allow more than $100 to be withdrawn. You can do this for kids, actually. You know, you give your college student a, a credit card, <laughs> and it's got $2,000 on it. Uh, make sure that they can't spend more than $100 at a time or $200 at a time or you know, they're not going to go out and buy something big with it. They're going to use it for what you're supposed to use it for. Maybe it has a $50 a day limit on it or something. Or You can put limits on stuff like that now. And it's to protect yourself. Otherwise your card gets stolen. Oh, I lost a card. No problem. They can only pull out $50. <laughs> or no, you can't take this card and go play with it. This is supposed to be for food. <laughs> you can only spend $50 a day on it. That's your per diem, you know. So you can kind of put restrictions on stuff like that. Um, and it's for protection, consumer protection, because we don't have any otherwise. Uh, we used to have a lot more, though. So we have Web 2.0 you've been staring at. This is the second generation web. This is actually old. We're now on 3.0. 2.0, so Web 1.0 is the WWW. It's the websites. It's the application that you're using, and it's really application-driven. Your email program, your FTP program, your web browser, that's Web 1.0. Web 2.0 is get rid of the web browser, get rid of the email program, get rid of the FTP program, and just make any program web-aware, web-accessible. So all your programs, your widgets, everything can access the Internet, your update services, all of it is Web 2.0. Windows updates Web 2.0. Web 3.0, we don't know we're on the Internet. I come home, I turn on my TV, and I watch TV. That's Web 3.0. There's no line between being online and offline. I can't turn it off. It's always online. I will look at my watch, and I see what time it is. It's Web 3.0 if it's using the Internet. And a lot of you know, we have one now. Actually, Google, Samsung's got one. Not quite there. I looked at it. I almost got one, and I went, no, 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 no. It's too big for my my wrist. But that's the first problem. But the second problem <coughs> is it's not sophisticated enough yet. I want my watch to be able to tell me. This is Web 3.0, by the way. I want my watch to be able to tell me how many new email messages I have from IT students, and uh, what's on my calendar. What's on my Google calendar for this week? And uh, what what you know? What do I have? And then uh, am I free right now for the next hour? Uh, and be tied with my computer. What about that document? Did I send that document? Let me go check my, my sent folders. Or is that spreadsheet? Let me take a look at that spreadsheet. Pull up that spreadsheet. Um, have access to my files, have access to my emails, have access to my calendar, have access to the time, my scheduler, everything on my watch or something. Or 
uh, better yet, on my tablet, which is what we get. We have some Web 3.0 kind of tablets working. It's not 100% there yet, just like the watch. The Samsung watch isn't there yet. The Samsung watch, right now, you can, I don't know if you can talk on the phone through it, but the idea was, it's not there yet, and not, and not to not to knock that product, they're very very much forefronters, but if I have a tablet, I have a computer, and I have a watch, I want it to be more intelligent. I want it so that I can just wear the watch and not have to have the phone with me. Why do I want to carry a phone, a computer, a tablet, a watch, and all this other stuff? Better yet, I want to, I'm looking for one of those. Remember those little old time pieces, you know? Um, old men used to have them. <laughs> old American men used to wear them like on their belts or something. They're like, uh, what do they call them? Uh, pocket watches. Pocket, pocket watch. I am so a pocket watch kind of person because, but well, I want my pocket watch to be a replacement for my computer, my cell phone, my tablets, and everything. I want it to have cellular service on it, IP service on it. I want, if I, if I have a call and someone's trying to reach me, my thing's going to vibrate. I'm going to pick it up and go, hey. And then uh, press a button, and then maybe if I have a Bluetooth headphone, I can talk on the phone or something like that. Or maybe I can just automatically reply to an email or something from it or something. That's Web 3.0. It's, everything's converged. It's not online or offline. You can have uh, interactive games. A lot of people are looking forward to the Web 3.0 game reality, where is the avatar a real person or is the avatar a computer person? Is this a game or is this reality? Which is like a lot of the 2.0 and a lot of the 1.0 games, they have that realism to it and it sucks people in. You know, like War War Warcrafts or whatever that is, or I can't remember what it's called, but people actually go on eBay and buy and sell game components and stuff and it's like part of their life. The problem with 3.0 and like a lot of the psychologists are saying is like, oh, that's really going to mess people up. <laughs> because... You know, you don't actually have to be real anymore. You don't even have to have, like, well, actually, there's a lot of 3.0 thinking that goes along with Facebook and social media. There's, and there's, a, for a while, there was a bunch of humorous commercials on this whole thinking, the whole psychology of it. You know, just because you have 3,000 friends, but she's sitting in the living room or sitting at a kitchen table checking, I have 3,000 friends, I wonder what my parents are doing. And the parents are out having fun with real people. You know, they're actually having a life. <laughs> <laughs> and she's sitting there, oh, I got 3,000 friends. They don't have any. You know, like, okay, what, what kind of reality is that? Well, the problem with that is they think that it's going gonna, it's gonna to make that worse. There's a lot of people out there who say, well, 3.0, Web 3.0 is going to make it worse. I guess people won't even leave their apartment now. They will just stay there because they got their friends, they got their job, they got their computer, they got everything. You can't just stand still forever. Is it really good for humans? You know, psychologically, probably not so good. So then there's that whole group of people out there, and I'm actually one of them that just goes low tech, throw away all the technology and just live life <laughs> kind of thing. Anyway, but long story short, that's Web 2.0, 3.0. We have 1.0 is a long time ago. 2.0 is old. 2.0 has been, been there, done that. Wiki, social media websites are 2.0. I'm, I'm looking for 3.0. So blogs, podcast feeds, wikis, social networking. That's two point. That's all the stuff you've been experiencing today. I'm waiting for that to go away. I want 3.0. I don't want to connect to the internet. You know, I, I'm already. I've already done that actually with my TV. I come home, I turn on my TV, and I watch TV. I say, "Oh, what's on?" I flip through my remote. It's on a Roku. <laughs> it's on the internet. I don't really think about is it really on the internet? Am I connecting, dialing up, going into the internet, connecting? No, 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 no. I just turn it on and switch the channel. <laughs> So, psychology, a psychological interaction, now used as keywords, mice, mice, and, and the like. You know. Yeah, they're physical interfaces instead of human interfaces. Um, so then we have the whole group of people that say, well, the psychological interaction from 2.0 is damaging enough. We have generations of high school children who can't write essays, who can't speak, who can't make eye contact with others, have no social skills. It's actually a reality. I'm not joking about that one, uh, which is bad, and it's happening in the U.S. more than anywhere else. It's kind of like, you know, they've been complaining for years about child obesity. If you ever, and this is true studies, too. This is kind of gross. If you ever go on the Internet and take a look at the trends, American kids are still getting fatter. <laughs> There's a huge problem with childhood obesity. Not only are they going to be fat now, but they're also stupid. 
because they lack social skills. So they're not very employable. So that's really good hope for you guys. <laughs> You're more intelligent. <laughs> you can actually have a conversation with somebody instead of going LOL and BTW and everything else associated with text speak. No, children are writing essays with LOL in it. It's like, what are you, where did you get this from? Wait, that's not English. And if you've ever tried to have a conversation with an American youth, good luck. Who knows what they're looking at? Or whether, you know, you see them actually interact in coffee shops and stuff, and or at uh, dinner tables in America. They all sit down and they're like this, text messaging themselves back and forth because they can't say what they really want to say out loud. So they're just going to go like this. So the whole family sits down. They text message each other. Then they get up. Say, so then better yet, why don't you just eat in that room? And you eat in that room. And you eat in that room. You can all text message each other. So that's really a more common trend. There's no more dinner table. You know who needs a dinner table anymore? You're only not going to be sitting there anyway together. Even though you are together, you're not really together. So it doesn't really matter. <laughs> better yet, you just be in Florida. You can be in Colorado. You can be in California. You can all eat dinner together. Ah, better yet, they'll even do it at the same time. Just do it at different times. <laughs> Then you get asynchronous education, <laughs> which is kind of like the theory of online education, actually. It's very 3.0-ish. You could be taking your test at 5 o'clock at night, 4 o'clock in the morning, I don't know. Any, and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You're all in the same class, but you're not all together. Uh, oh, we have attendance. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, no, no, it's okay. Let me pause this. It's good. Okay, so let me wrap up this lecture in the next 15 minutes or so, uh, so we can get ourselves out of here. Sorry for, I don't want to you know, let us go too late, but I can always finish this next week. But let me just finish uh, some concluding comments on, uh, so I was talking about the psychological interaction and uh, the voice, the iris scanning, and also looking at interfaces capturing your bo real body characteristics as part of the technology. So that's the positive part of it outside of the social effects of uh, or lack of skills that are being obtained by um, can we hold down the conversations just for a little bit longer I promise to only go about 10 more minutes here um, pros and cons to technology anyway so automatic speech recognition is another technology that's being used not only capturing spoken words but also distinguishing groups of words for, to form sentences and figuring out what people are saying uh, becoming more of a reality these days and uh, the costs are going down which is making it um, definitely more uh, more available and more used more widely used so automatic speech recognition three-step process as well as figuring out future analysis capturing words sentences converting them um, syllables and stuff to, to, to sentences and actually for uh, assisting people in speaking, also looking at pattern classifications, matching phenomena of words in um, acoustic model database, and figuring out who said something by what they're saying, not only by the content, but also the tone and the way that they're saying things. And then language processing that makes sense that where you're saying by choosing the best words. So it's not, it goes beyond the Siri concept. Siri is the, you know, the, the iPhone phenomena of somebody actually talking to you. Uh, we're making a lot more advancements past that concept and using it for web searching, for analysis, for recognition of people, which gives us virtual reality or works into this concept of virtual reality that goes above and beyond speech recognition. <clears throat> but it's the three-dimensional computer simulation. It's the physical participation. We have uh, three unique devices from just in the last couple of years here, the, the glove, the Google glasses, the glove, the headsets, walkers, all sorts of different 3D devices. So the Web 3.0 will really be, an, uh, really be a, a nice reality when those Google glasses and those Google goggles come into place because you're augmenting reality at that point. You have a computer screen that's on a glass that you're wearing. If you haven't seen these Google goggles or glasses yet, that augments reality with computer reality. So you can insert something in there. You can use um, information. It might just be information where you walk up to someone and it tells me who that person is, which is not part of reality. It's part of the computer and it's part of three, Web 3.0, essentially, where I've got augmented 
internet reality that's part of my reality, I can't tell the difference. So I can tell who people are. So as an example, if I can't remember somebody's name, I can put on the glasses, for example, the computer chips, everything is in the glasses. I just wear the glasses and I go, oh, who are you? Oh. And I can think it, you know, perhaps in the future we can think it and I'll have some connection with the neurons in my brain, probably hopefully through the skin and not <coughs> inserted into my skin, which it is now. They actually have this now. They have uh, computer chips. Right now it's inserted, but for, the, you know, pancreas things, for uh, diabetic people, for... Um, to control biological systems through a computer, to insert chemicals or to change the balance of something when needed, um, and to actually to, to make the human existence, um, you know, definitely enhanced by computer technology from a biological perspective. It's bio, bio everything these days. Um, well, what about now? They have actually they actually have a device out now. I saw it at a trade show recently. It's a sweatband. You remember those little those ugly little sweatband things you wore around her head, but it has to touch your skin. So you put the band on and it reads your mental, reads your, your thoughts and it reads your impulses. What was it called? Headband. It's, it's a headband, but there's like a sensor on it. They have one right now that charges a battery. I think that was pretty cool. Where you wear the headband and it charges your cell phone through your electrical system. I don't know how it's working, what, how it's working. It's a prototype. I haven't seen a real product. And I haven't seen it on the market yet. But they have ones now that they're saying in the future it'll just be instead of a band, make it into like a little dot or something. And you put it like maybe behind your ear or something where you can't see it. And it'll communicate with your Google Glass. So you can walk up to someone, you know, it'll, it takes you and it tells you electronically perhaps who that person is. You know, maybe you'll hear it, or maybe you'll see it on your screen, or maybe you'll just know it. So that is really scary. That seems very scary to me. Huh? It should. There's no reason why it can't work. I mean, you got it. Well, we're still having problems understanding the brain, however. To give you a mental impulse or a mental thought has not been discovered yet. That's future. That's futurist. That's like Web 4.0. To put the Internet into your brain, that's like 4.0 or 5.0. To make it so you can't tell the difference between the internet and reality, that's 3.0. So we're not we're not at 4 or 5. 3.0, I'm not going to tell you something, it's going to show you something. So you'll see, you walk up to somebody, and you'll have to think something. That's really too advanced right now. You can't, I, if I said, I want to think, I want to move the cup, and the cup moves, that's way too advanced right now. Which would be the same as saying, what is your name? I can't remember your name. But my Google Glasses have you, it's recognized you, and it knows who you are. It could tell me, but my brain can't tell it yet. Instead, I'd have to press a button, or I'd have to flip a switch, or I'd have to do something physically so that my brain, I want to know what your name is, I press a button, I see your name. So they have it with a band, there's a band, so you can touch stuff on the band to show stuff on the glasses. It's a prototype right now, it's not on the market yet. Where you could do facial recognition, you can do... Is it cold? Is it hot? Tell me the temperature outside, stuff like that, you know, temperature button. So I can just see it. Or I don't have to look at something. I have to go to and look at it. But if I see it, then I'll know. Can I? So it's delivering the knowledge into the brain, getting the from the brain out. That's definitely more advanced than today's technology. But the concept of augmenting reality, they're doing it in film right now, actually. Um, it's not overlaying one on the other. It's putting the character into the scene while it's happening in the scene so that the actors can actually interact with the fake characters. Or the, you know, I should say fake, the, not the computer-generated stuff. So you can actually create a set, augmented set, and then have the people on the set in the set, and they see the set, but the set's not really there. The set's computer-generated. That's what they're doing that right now in Hollywood in terms of getting realism. So what does that do? Well, you don't have to actually build the set now. You don't have to have the the this, the the big old well in the old days, the biggest thing was the shark. They augmented the shark in Jaws, if you remember that. You don't have to have Jaws augmented anymore. If you go to Universal Studios, you can actually still see the half Jaws. It's like a head part of it, and the whole body of it was computer filled in. Or something of like that. I don't remember the story behind Jaws, but long story short, that was like the first breaking, groundbreaking technology in terms of the big realism thing. 
And, uh, you know, they've been playing around with years with digital arts with being able to do that. But now there's a lot of augmented reality being used with that. And we're seeing more of it. It makes, definitely makes for, um, you know, more interesting Hollywood movies. But what about taking it out of the movie and making it into your life? You know, that's, that would be pretty nice, I think. But uh, man, we're not quite there. We're not even on 3.0 yet. So we've got to get to 3.0 before we can get past into 4 or 5.0. So maybe another 10 years from now, people will be going, oh, yeah, computers, what are those? You know, well, you have a computer? Why do you have a computer? What do you need a computer for? Because you don't need a computer anymore. A computer's not part of your life, you know, so maybe, you know, this concept of using a computer is going to go, I hope it goes away, actually. People are stuck on these computers, you know. What do you, and I'm, I, and I, I teach computer stuff. What are you using a computer for? I, I, I stride... You know, my, my goal during the day is like, how often can I not be on the computer? Can I just have my computer knowledge but not be on the computer? And that's why I like tablets so much because I'm not carrying around a big old computer with me. But I still am in touch with my email and I'm still in touch with what's going on with my voicemail and I still have everything. I don't carry a phone anymore. I got rid of the phone about a year and a half ago. I don't need a phone anymore. I can answer a call on my tablet. I can do everything I want and when I want. In fact, I have my tablet. I just put it, it connects to my car, and I talk most of the time while I'm driving. <laughs> but it, I don't have a phone, so I'm hands-free anyway, right? But it's all being transmitted through my tablet. What do I need a phone for? Anyway, and I'm constantly irritated by people that are just constantly text messaging back and forth. It's like, why are you doing that? Just talk to the person. Or call the person up and talk to them. Or just do it, you know, when you have to do it for something. So you have all these people that share everything. You're like, I hate Twitter. People like share everything on Twitter. I'm going to the bathroom. I better send a tweet. Say, like, who cares if you're going to the bathroom? I really don't care. When I see you, I'll talk to you. you know? <laughs> and you can tell me you went to the bathroom. That's what well, I don't know. A couple of my friends call them tweets because it sounds like you're tweeting, like you're urinating, you're going to the bathroom. Anyway, I'll leave that subject alone. Anyway, so <laughs> that's what I think about tweeting. Uh, anyway, so a virtual reality, I'll kind of end on this concept because this is a good stopping point, uh, but virtual reality is definitely part of engineering management in terms of the devices and things we're going to be using in the future. This is a little bit dated, but Met Met Matsushi Tita's Design Your Own Virtual Kitchen. Now you can design your own house, you can design your own everything. You can't build cars yet, but that would be nice to be able to build your own car like you build your own house. And then the manufacturing plant can just produce it for you. We're not there yet. Uh, Volvo demonstrates car safety features through virtual reality. Um, this started like a long time ago with the car industry with driver's training. You took driver's training in the U.S. You watched videos in front of like this steering wheel with an on and a gas pedal and a brake. And it simulated. It was a simulation machine. They used to have them in trailers. They parked a trailer at the school. The kids went out and they took driver's training. It's in old movies if you missed it. But... Uh, now it's more of a reality for flight training. The military does all of their simulations. You don't, you don't necessarily have to get in a plane to be able to fly a plane. So that was pretty big for a while. Now most of the attacks and most of the training is done in a safer environment. So you know what you're doing, hopefully, when you get into the dangerous situation. So a lot of your uh, chemical is all done by robotics now. So you don't have to send a human out to a, you know, a very hot place or a very cold place or a very toxic place. So save the human, put a robot out there. So that's kind of the virtual reality kind of thing where you're operating the robot from a computer screen and you're a human, not the computer. Well, in 3.0, it would take the computer and that's everything. Take the human out of it. And the computer just interfaces with the human. You know, hey, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> can I go for lunch soon? Oh, okay. <laughs> Computers don't have to eat, so I don't know. Anyway, so Motorola, train assembly line workers, healthcare, doctors. I just watched something the other day, actually. It was on YouTube. It was brain surgery done by a robot. Does a pretty good job. Removes a robot that removes brain tumors, that does open brain surgery, and while the doctors watch. It was actually pretty cool. It was really cool. You actually, just Google brain surgery, robotic brain surgery. It's all over YouTube right now. That's really cool. And I think it's because they're now doing it successfully. Nobody wants to watch the ones that <laughs> go wrong. <laughs> but now when the computer does it correctly, then people want to watch it. 
you know, because it's a better job. It takes out less of the bad tissue, more, it's more focused on the tumor, it can actually r remove just the tumor. Where most people, they go in for brain surgery, and I, you know, you know, what in the world's going to happen? You know, most people fear, I've never had brain surgery before, but, and I've never known anyone who has, but from the literature, when you read it, the biggest concern is what kind of side effect are you going to have from things that weren't related to it, you know, like good tissue removed or damage done by the removal. So if you can come in with a very small laser-like apparatus that's not human, and you can remove just the tumor, nothing else, and not damage anything else around it, and do it non-invasively, then you're looking at, and they were showing the patients from before and after, you can't tell they had brain surgery. <laughs> you can't tell. So, I mean, it's not mainstream yet. It's all experimental at this point. But it's definitely medical science and computer technology definitely has some nice application in the future. So, you know, electronic, well, now we have laser, you know, eye surgery these days. People don't have to wear glasses. People can have corrective everything done. If you extend it out to more technology applied towards that science, we have better improved medical care, essentially. And it's not life threatening or life catastrophic. Some of the things that you know used to, you know, get rid of humans now will preserve humans. So anyway, long story short, I'll leave you on that that note because we're gonna move into I'm gonna move into a different concept, but I'll pick this up where I left off last time. And unfortunately, our lecture is kind of short today, but uh, we're I'm on a time frame here where you guys are on schedules too, so I got I sort of have to end. But um, I will see you next week. We have a couple more weeks of this left. This is Thanksgiving, so have a happy Thanksgiving this week if you celebrate Thanksgiving. And I'll see you next Monday. We we have class next week, yeah. No Thanksgiving holiday because Thanksgiving is on Thursday. ITU is closed, by the way, on Friday. If you have Friday classes, yeah, you, it should be Thursday. ITU should be closed on Thursday and Friday, according to my notes. So there's no classes on Thursday or Friday. But unfortunately, we're on Monday. <laughs> so we don't get it all. All right. So have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>